And the answer is, even if everything else was absolutely constant, there'd be 256 different ways that this could turn out. That's a lot of variation just there. Now, it's actually much more complicated than that. Here's the data from Nathan's lab. So what they did was they, using um, recombinant DNA techniques in mouse, they developed a strain of mouse, mice where one X chromosome, if it was active, would produce a protein that fluoresces green. Let's say it's the maternal X. is on. And the other X chromosome, let's say it's the paternal X, produced a protein that glows red. Now the diagrams that you're looking at are sections through the skin of the mice. Um, this is the superficial top layer of the skin. This is a deeper layer of the skin. And what you see very clearly is patches. Patches of cells where the red chromosome is active. Patches of cells where the green chromosome is active. But these are quite small patches. Um, only, you know, 20, 50, 100, several hundred cells. Very tiny little patches. Now, here are some more figures from the same research paper. These are two retinas from the two eyes of one mouse. Now, a retina is actually a cup-shaped structure, but in order to get the retina to lie flat on the microscope slide, they had to slice it like you would split the peel of an orange. So this is a cup-shaped retina that's been sliced so it will lie flat on the microscope. The dramatic thing is you can see the patches of red and green, but you can see that the left retina has more red and the right retina has more green. So this mouse sees the world slightly, may see the world slightly differently with their two eyes. Um, depending on which alleles of the opsin genes are present on the paternal and the maternal chromosome. Here's a really dramatic difference. This is a brain of a mouse. And what you can see is that one side of the brain is expressing almost entirely maternal X chromosomes, whereas the other side is expressing a mixture that leans more heavily into the red. And finally, here are two litter mates. Now, I'm sure this was the most extreme example that they had, but these two mice are siblings, and one is expressing mostly the maternal X chromosome, with little bits of paternal. The other one is expressing much more of the paternal X chromosome. All of these differences are just the results of chance. Which X chromosome happened to get inactivated at which stage in development? Now, finally, um, the randomness can itself be subject to genetic variation. This is an analysis of a particular protein that's expressed in the worm C. elegans, which is a standard laboratory subject of study. And you can see that in normal cells, there's not very much variation in how much of this EL2, ELT2 genes protein is present. It's pretty consistent. The blue is the nuclei of the cells. You can see when there's more cells, there's more of the pink protein as well. But here are cells of a worm that carries a mutation in a particular gene, and this mutation makes the cells much more sensitive to chance events. So that by chance, this cell is expressing lots of the protein. These two cells are not. So we've put the cap on our consideration of the sources of variation by thinking about the importance of chance events with an emphasis on chance events at the molecular level, chance events in gene regulation, and chance events in development. Coming up next, 
we're going to move to thinking about cancer. I know you're in, everyone's interested in cancer. We talked a bit about it in Module 4, but now we're going to really deeply investigate the genetic basis of the variation in the risk of cancer, which will give us also just a much deeper understanding of how cancer comes about. I hope to see you there.